singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply becoming a patron via interviewthefuture.com. Today, my guest on the show is Juan Enriquez. Juan is a best-selling author, TED All-Star with nine TED Talks, and honestly, I couldn't even count how many TEDx Talks he has done. He's an angel investor and managing director of Excel Venture Management. Juan has sailed around the world on an expedition that increased the number of known genes a hundredfold and was a part of the peace commission that negotiated the ceasefire with the Zapatistas in Mexico. In 2005, he published a book titled The Untied States of America, Polarization, Fracturing and Our Future, where he basically predicted the real estate, credit and economic collapse of 2008. Most recently, Enriquez is the author of Right, Wrong, How Technology Transforms Our Ethics, so honestly I couldn't think of a more perfect moment or person to have a conversation with today on Singularity FM. So, welcome to Singularity FM, Juan. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. So, Juan, if I were to meet you in the good old days where we could meet each other in person at a conference, let's say at TED, hopefully one day, and if I ask you, let's say I've never seen uh, any of your talks, which I've seen all of them, but let's say I never did, I've never read any of your books, which I've read one and I've looked through another. And I ask you, who is Juan Enriquez? How would you reply to me in your own words in a sentence? So I think I'm a very curious, optimistic curmudgeon. So I think things are not going well today. They will go far better in the future. And I'm very curious to see what the future holds. I would love to be born in 100 years. I see the curious and the optimistic part, but where's the curmudgeon part? I'd never saw that. Well, I think we're, you know, as a species, we are doing some stuff which is um, really silly. We're treating each other um, through divisions as opposed to with kindness and humility. We're ever more divided. Um, on all sides, and we're doing enormous damage to the environment. But I think all that is fixable. <laughs> Hence the optimism. That's fantastic. Okay, uh, actually, I just uh, my last interview reminded me to one of my favorite quotes from um, Italian communist or socialist theorist uh, Gramsci, of all the people, who said that uh, all revolutionaries must be. Uh, skeptics of the intellect and optimists of the will. I think that is, uh, I think that's a very appropriate thing to do these days because I think so many people are absolutely certain of their intellect and their rightness. Um, and it's very destructive. The While we're on socialist and communist quotes, I have also been reminded during 2020 of um, London's quote that there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And it seems like we've already lived five years this month. <laughs> yeah, and the last year, it seems like we lived a decade. So, yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, if I were to ask you then to choose one word besides curious and optimistic. Are you an entrepreneur, an academic, an author, a speaker, a philosopher, because we'll be talking a lot about ethics today, or a storyteller perhaps, because you've done so many talks, and I see that you always open up with a very good story. I try very hard to not be one thing. It would bore me to tears. Um, that's the best answer, honestly. I try not to be one thing. That's awesome. Okay, so let's see. 
where does, or maybe I should ask you first a little bit about what you do on a day-to-day -day life. What can you tell us about uh, Excel Venture Management? What do you guys do there and what's your sort of day-to-day -day responsibility there? So day-to-day, -day, I'm a um, venture capitalist and we invest in um, technologies that we try and change the world for better. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it's a disaster. Um, it's always interesting, it's always challenging. Sometimes it's fun. And in essence, what we try and do is pick big problems and go after them. So we're now working with uh, Mary Lou Jepsen on trying to bring medical imaging outside of these enormous million dollar rooms in hospitals uh, into office buildings, into ambulances and make imaging faster, better, cheaper. Um, which is especially important if you have a stroke because there's two kinds of strokes. One stroke, uh, your the blood flow is blocked and your brain starts to starve. And the other kind of stroke, the, the vessels have broken and your brain is flooded. And fortunately, we've got a medicine to undo blockages. But if you apply that medicine to people who are having hemorrhages, you kill them. So what we would like to do is we'd like to shorten the time between diagnosis and the application of this medicine. So it'll make an enormous difference in paralysis. And so we're trying to do that across a range of things. We've tried to do that across antibiotic resistance. We've tried to do it around renewable fuels. We've tried to do it um, in large scale medical imaging and records. And in each case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a great big problem and solve it in a way that makes it faster, better, cheaper. That's, that's great and, and very commendable, of course, but you said that sometimes it works and sometimes it's a disaster. So is it possible at all for us to share an example of each of those? So, when it works, it's brilliant. Um, you know, sometimes when it works, you, you're you able to create medicines that may end up being truly important for cancer. Um, and, and that's something that we are pretty close to doing, which would affect almost half of all cancers. Um, wow. And, and again, when you're in venture, you're a bit player, you're a supporting player. Um, the, the stars are these incredible entrepreneurs and scientists and they work incredible hours and they work against all odds. Um, and, you know, we're, we're sideline coaches, we're not the players. Um, but it's still a pretty extraordinary thing because what you're doing every day is you're, you're getting these almost Christmas gifts of human ingenuity. So you're getting Nature Magazine, you're getting Science Magazine, you're getting uh, MIT Tech Review, you're getting notes from people you know, you're getting recommendations, you're getting business plans. And each of these is somebody's dream to change the world. And they come in all shapes and all sizes. Most of them are things that we don't support um, but occasionally you see something combined with a person who's an extraordinary individual and, and then you start dreaming and, um, you get very close to these things and you get very close to these things. You get very close to these things. And sometimes they just run out of money or they run out of time or they blow up or somebody changes regulations or a competitor comes to market earlier. Um, it's a process not dissimilar to being a scientist in a lab where you're trying to run experiments, you're trying to find something new, and sometimes the experiment just doesn't work. Sometimes you're scooped by a competitor. Sometimes your job tenure runs out. Um, that's the same kind of process. Um, and it's, it's always interesting, always challenging. 
and sometimes great fun. So you see the bunch of petri dishes with culture, and then some of them catch, and some of them don't, and some of them like totally unexpected stuff happens. Yes, and and that totally unexpected stuff is really fascinating, right? Because um, COVID is a very good example of you know some of the things that we've invested in. Um, all of a sudden. You can do stuff in months that you couldn't have done in years uh, because of the urgency of this. And COVID has been an absolute unmitigated tragedy for a series of countries, including Mexico and the United States, because of the mismanagement of the epidemic. Um, so there's no way that you can characterize COVID as a good thing. But within a tragedy, you have found that telemedicine has become far more important and that has created an interaction between the patient and the doctor, which I think is far more agile. Emailing your doctor has become common, it didn't used to be. Having doctors practice across state lines, having some elite regulatory competitive barriers lowered um, all of these things are things which were absolutely essential in the system, which was operating almost in the reverse of Moore's law. So while most of the world's getting faster, better, cheaper, the cost of bringing a medicine to market and the cost of a medicine has been skyrocketed. Something similar may or may not happen in education. And, and that's a really interesting question because the two things that are essential for people's livelihood and future, education and health, are two things that have been way exceeding the cost and rate of inflation. Um, so we're paying more and more for less and less in terms of productivity. Yeah, I, I want to put one caveat there, though, because uh, perhaps we want to differentiate between the cost and the price. Uh, because what comes to my mind is the example of insulin. Insulin was invented in my alma mater in University of Toronto. Uh, and the guy who invented insulin gave it away for a buck, basically. because And it was the fastest ever given, I think, Nobel Prize in medicine. Uh, because instantaneously it started saving people's lives. So we have that. And that was done, I don't know, 80 or 90 years ago. So now you have this, it's kind of in the public domain, uh, it's been around forever, so you, the cost is not growing of insulin, yet the price, especially in the United States, has been growing way, way ahead about, above inflation, I think, which is why we had so many excursions, quote unquote, from the United States, and now actually Bernie Sanders joined uh, one of those buses ones to come over in Canada to buy insulin Americans coming over to Canada to buy insulin across the border. I completely agree with you. I mean, there is so many distortions in the system. Um, and there's so much finger pointing as to whose fault it is that these costs are so high. And we've got to quit making excuses about it. We've got to start putting medicine on a faster, better, cheaper cost curve, because unless if you can solve a problem like that, you're just not going to have personalized medicines for cancer, which means you're not going to solve cancer because, because cancer isn't one disease. It's, you know, tens of thousands of different diseases that manifest as uncontrolled tissue growth. Okay. So we clearly see that you care a lot about making a difference about, um, investing, uh, about having fun, uh, about uh, science and technology. Um, can you walk us through your personal journey? Which one was first in your life journey? Was it first technology? Was it first science? Was it first investment? Or was it first that you discovered ethics? How, do we, how did each of those come into your life or when? Each of those is new, 
every decade I try and learn something completely different and play at the top of the field. Um, and it's part of what motivates me and keeps me alive. So I had a the weirdest possible journey. And for anybody who's listening, who thinks, oh, it's too late for me, or I didn't pick the right path, uh, believe me, life throws you a lot of curveballs and you can change and end up in places you would never imagine. So I grew up in Mexico. I went to a conservative Catholic school. Um, I went to mass every morning in Latin between seven and eight. Every morning, uh, not only Sundays. Every morning. My uh, goodness. For all of grammar school, because that was part of what they asked you to do. And, uh, you know, my world was Mexico, and I thought Mexico was the most important thing in the world. And I thought, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to try and make Mexico better. So I studied uh, politics and government and economics and went back and worked in Mexico's government for a while and had some extraordinary jobs. Um, and uh, then I got caught up in the violence. And they tried to kill me, and I thought, that's probably not a good thing. So I left to go to the States for a year and I studied why Mexico didn't work. And that led to a study of why countries appear and disappear, which led to the untied States of America, which led me to technology. And I had never met with scientists. I'd never interacted with scientists. I'd never had a science mentor. Um, and by sheer accident at a New Year's dinner, I met a guy and listened to him for three hours. <laughs> and he told me about this thing called genomics, which in 1995 was absolutely obscure. Nobody knew what genomics was in 95 outside of the field. Um, within three months, I'd sailed across the Atlantic with him. And when I got back to Harvard, I changed my career. I changed from international affairs and government to uh, biology. I worked in a bio lab. Was that guy called Craig Venter? That guy was called Craig Venter. <laughs> um, and so I spent the next decades thinking and learning about life sciences as a researcher, as an author, and as an inventor as an academic and as an investor. And for the last, call it eight years, I started getting more and more interested in the impact that you have when you can alter life code. So if you can change the shape and function of all living things, what are the ethics of that? And I also got more and more interested in the ultimate form of life, which is intelligence and consciousness. And so I changed my lab again, or the lab I work in again, and started working with an absolutely extraordinary human being and researcher called Ed Boyden in the synthetic neurobiology lab at MIT. I've had Ed on my podcast before. Maybe yeah, five years ago. He's a class act. He's a super, super human being. Um, so I'm going to spend the next decade on the brain and thinking about the ethics of both the technology and the ethics of understanding the brain, understanding memories, erasing some memories, uh, sharing feelings in a physical sense, in an emotional sense, uh, thinking about what happens when you remake brains, when you reshape brains, when you image brains, when you map brains. And that's the journey that I want to spend all oh, the next 10 years on. So it sounds like ethics was kind of among the last sort of pickups on the, on the journey, perhaps, or or more kind of focused? Well, see, ethics gets interesting to me. 
traditionally ethics is the single most boring thing that you discuss, <laughs> right? You, you don't, back when we used to go to work, you, you didn't sit around the water cooler and talk about the HR ethics manual, right? When you arrive at a university, when you arrive at a new job, they, they give you a great big book. And that book is the ethics manual and you, you have to take a course on it. And it says you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't do that. And it's, it's mostly a negative document of things you should not do. If you don't know that before you arrive at that job or at that university, you're probably in the wrong place because the things in there are written by Captain Obvious. And it's pretty clear you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z to human beings. The part that got me fascinated about ethics is the things that blindside us, the things that catch us on the wrong side of history. And it's, it's the intersection of how do things change? So the traditional model of ethics is I know right from wrong, this is right, this is wrong. What happens if right and wrong shift 180 degrees in short periods of time? And what happens if technology is the main driver of changes in ethics as opposed to religions or philosophers or uh, lawyers? And, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was brought up again by everybody I respected to know that being gay was absolutely right. Absolutely so, wrong. Absolutely wrong. So if you look at what Catholic doctrine was and almost every religion's doctrine was when I was growing up, and I'm pretty old, um, if you look at what the laws were, if you look at what parents were teaching, if you look at what the preacher was teaching, if you look at what your peers were teaching, what society was teaching. In fact, in the United States, and Mexico is more conservative than the United States, in the United States through 1997, two thirds of Americans were absolutely against gay marriage. And what's fascinating to me is by 2017, two thirds are for gay marriage. And we now have a situation where if you're not in favor of equality for same sex and every other variety of sexual orientation, you should be boycotted, you should be fired, you should go out of business, you should be isolated from the tribe. And even the Pope has been on this journey. So in 2010, he comes out, writes a letter to the Carmelite nuns saying that the Marriage Equality Act is the work of the devil. Three years later as Pope, he gives one of his most famous interviews with the tagline, who am I to judge? And seven years after that, day before yesterday, he yep. comes out in favor of civil unions, yep. right? So what's fascinating to me about my journey and his journey and so many other people's journey is something you're brought up to believe is an absolute gets flipped to such an extent that if you believe what you were brought up to believe, you are to be condemned and ostracized. And it's fascinating to me how quickly our notions of pretty fundamental thoughts can shift. So if you look at the tabloids just before the first quote unquote test tube baby was born, massive numbers of people thinking a test tube baby is wrong, unnatural, against God's will and not to be done. Soulless Little Devils or something like that was one of the, ti the titles, yes. the headlines. And what's fascinating is then you get the picture and the headline in the tabloids instead of, you know, test your baby, the, the headline was this beautifully swaddled child's photograph and it said the lovely Louise. 
And within days and weeks, you had a 180 degree shift in the majority opinion on idea. And so in today's activist times, one of the things that worries me in the benefit of hindsight of having lived a few decades is there is so much fury and there is so much certainty and there is so much, I am absolutely right. And if you don't agree with me a hundred percent, I will destroy your career because you use the wrong word, because you said the wrong thing, because you were photographed next to somebody at a dinner, because you wore the wrong costume a decade ago, because you published something 20 years ago that is completely insulting to me today. So you have to separate two concepts. The first concept is, Probably what the person said was wrong. Probably the costume they wore was absolutely indefensible. Maybe what they wrote 20 years ago, you know, really is insulting somebody today as we have learned. But if technology changes ethics, and if ethics and technology are accelerating in terms of their change, it's really important to use two words that almost seem like swear words because they're never used today, which is humility and forgiveness. So you have to think of two notions of ethics. One notion of ethics is I am right and I will always be right. In which case there's no debate, there's no learning, there's no progress and there's certainly no humor. A second notion is I certainly understand human beings aren't perfect. I certainly understand they have done horrendous things throughout history. But on the whole, if you were born at random in a John Rawls sense, and you don't know what color you're gonna be, how smart you're gonna be, who your parents are gonna be, how much you're gonna earn, how much education you're gonna get, there's probably no decade or century in human history that you would rather be born into than today. You do not want to be somebody who is of a different skin color in the 1950s or the 1900s or the 1800s. You do not want to be a woman born into the 1930s or the 1850s. You do not want to be somebody who's disabled born a century ago. Um, you, your chances of having more wealth not a lot of wealth, but not starving today, born at random into Africa, born at random in Asia, are much higher than any previous time. And so in that context, you have to separate out, this individual is doing things which are absolutely wrong from, I know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that will never change because we are doing a lot of things wrong today that as technology advances, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren are gonna look back on and say, boy, these people were primitive and boy, were these people unethical. Wow, you know, it's, that, that, that's, that's all fantastic and I agree with you. Uh, but it's kind of sad to me at the same time because, you know, to me personally, ethics was always this kind of a very fun thing that you get to discuss. This thing where it's very hard to get to right and wrong, if at all possible, without being moral relativist myself, because I come from the sort of Socratic school of dialectical method of investigation. And also at the same time, interestingly enough, in ancient Greece, uh, homosexuality was not looked down like it was, you know, for most of the time thereafter. In fact, you know, arbitrarily Plato has this kind of ranking of love uh, and he puts the love between two men at the top, between a man and a woman at the bottom, uh, at the middle, and then between two women actually at the bottom. Uh, you know, but say that what it may say, still, it was kind of a, in many ways, much more 
uh, open society or open society. And, and also Socrates was known for the fact that he didn't know. That's why he was the wisest Athenian, because he knew that he didn't know, whereas the other people didn't even know that much, because they were darn sure that they knew. As Mark Twain put it once, it is not the things that we're not sure, certain about that usually get us in trouble, but it is the things that we are damned certain of that usually do. <laughs> And what you're talking about, that absolute certainty and lack of humility is is a big problem of the issue today. And yet, interestingly enough, you chose a very black and white cover for your book with very sharp delineation between right and wrong. And the right is, one is on the back, on the white background with black letters, the other is on the black background with light white letters. So there's no gray there, it seems. So uh, is that sort of like to make a point like, let's say the anti-war movies often depict extreme violence and hence are anti-war instead of glorifying it? Or tell us a little bit about the cover and, and that choice. So I wanted the cover to reflect today's zeitgeist. Um, um, you know, when I talk about technology changing ethics and how you do things and how you relate to others in fundamental ways, you can take one of the most extreme examples of human beings treating each other in the wrong way, which was World War I. And the greatest single driver of change in World War I, where there was no gallantry, no interaction, was the machine gun. And so what the machine gun did is it created trenches. So all of a sudden you weren't on the battlefield, you were in a hole in the ground. And there was absolutely no ambiguity. You were in the German trench or you were in the British trench or the French trench. And that's it, right? I mean, you know, the, there is no middle ground. There is no place to dialogue. There is no place to occupy outside of those two trenches. And if you left the trench in one direction, you'd be shot by the other side. And if you tried to leave the trench in the other direction, then you'd be shot by your side as a deserter. And that's kind of the situation that we've put ourselves in, in countries as polarized as the UK and the US. Canada has been a very different place. Um, to its credit, Canada, I think, is a model for the world on a lot of things. But in the United States and in the UK, you are on this side or you're on this side. You believe in this or you believe in that. And anybody who deviates even slightly from the orthodoxy of that tribe gets strung up. And so you have the situation where it's not just the other side that is machine gunning you with tweets and with Facebook posts and with accusations and with rumors and with, you know, horrible stuff. Sometimes it's your own side that is burning you at the stake. And so when you try and have a debate on campus, if somebody doesn't like the topic, if somebody feels you use the wrong word, if somebody feels you disrespected them if somebody feels you didn't say enough about their cause or their thing. They will burn you. They will try and run you off campus. They will not let you speak. They will try and cancel everything you've done. And the tragedy of that is most human beings are somewhere in the middle. So to take an example, driving around the place where I am now, which is Maine. Maine is an interesting place because it is truly a contested state in the United States. And so you see a lot of Biden signs and you see a lot of Trump signs. And what's fascinating to me is on a lot of lawns, you see a sign that says Black Lives Matter. And on a lot of lines, you see signs that say, we support the police. 
what you don't see is a law that says Black Lives Matter and we support the police. You don't see those signs side by side on the same law. But when you poll people, two thirds of people are supporting BLM and two thirds of the people don't want the police defunded. And for some reason, these trenches have made that black and white. They've made it something that is, you're on this side and if you dare deviate, it will cost you in, in your own tribe. So even though you have this big middle ground of people, people are, are very wary of trying to occupy that no man's land. What gives me hope in the future is that when they do, the reaction is overwhelming support. So last week, the two candidates, the Republican candidate, the Democratic candidate for the governorship of Utah came out together in the same ad and said, I'm so-and-so, I'm a Republican, I'm so-and-so, I'm a Democrat. I hope you vote for me, I hope you vote for me. But the message in the thing was, we may disagree on policy, but we don't disagree on making Utah a better place. And we don't disagree on a united America. And we can talk to each other in a civil way and whoever's elected will support each other. That thing got 2.8 million views in 24 hours because that's the space that people are hungry for. And, and that's the space that we're, we're being radicalized out of. And that is especially dangerous for ethics because, you know, to go back to the French Revolution, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And so if you're on this side and only on this side and you never question, you can do barbarous things like put children in cages and lose their parents. And you may end up in the Human Rights Commission in The Hague for crimes against humanity. And by the way, you should. That is absolutely indefensible. And anybody who was a part of that, anybody who supported that, should be tried for crimes against humanity. You do not do what the Argentine generals did. You do not do what the Brazilian generals did. You do not do what the Chilean generals did, which is to deliberately rip away children and kill or lose their parents. That is a crime against humanity. That has been tried. It drives me crazy that people are so black and white today and so divided that they just don't see that, even though in the abstract, taken out of a political context, there is no way that 99% of Americans would support that. And, and how we got to this point, how we got to this point of anger, polarization, trench warfare, is something we should think about long and hard, because if we don't, we're going to rip this nation apart. What of those people who would tell you, well, Juan, you are being black and white right now when you're describing this one case, despite the fact that I personally agree with you 100%. You know, my background is in political science and philosophy, and I studied just war theory and all that. So I agree with you 100%, but someone would come back at both of us and say, well, you guys are very black and white at this now. So I think part of the danger of trench warfare is war criminals can hide inside that trench and be justified. So when you have a false equivalence of, um, you know, well, yes, we did lose 545 kids, but the other side uh, may have said something stupid or done something stupid 20 years ago. You, you create this false moral equivalence between one side and the other. And, and part, of the, part of the issue on ethics is when you believe everybody on the other side is evil, first you create no bridge for them to come partially over to your viewpoint. 
and, and to meet somewhere in the middle. And second, you provide cover to those who were truly evil inside there. So when everybody's killing, it's much easier for a mass murderer to hide in among the killers. And what you don't want as a society is you don't want those who are committing crimes against humanity to be able to hide under the cover of your tribe. I think there absolutely are black and white at the extremes of ethics, right? You, you practice cannibalism. There's no ambiguity on that. You, you go and you rip children away from their parents deliberately and lose the parents as a mechanism to reduce immigration. There is no ambiguity on that. There's just absolutely no gray area on that. You go and you kill your political opponent instead of having a just and fair election in a democracy. There's no ambiguity on that. So I guess what I'm saying is Ethics is a little bit like that uh, book that I hear was popular, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> and those shades get darker and lighter as you get towards the edges. But actually, they get much darker as you get towards the edges. Right? So as you get towards the outer edges, you can get to the point where you can truly hurt people against their will. And there's no ambiguity on that one, right? That, it's, it's the shades, and the closer you get to the edges, the more important it is for society and tribes to isolate and punish behaviors that are unacceptable to us as human beings. You know, you gave some fantastic examples from Utah about building those bridges between one end and the other end. And of course... Uh, despite the fact that I agree with you mostly on World War I too and the, the, the sort of the nightmarishness and, and the extremistness of, of trench warfare, you know, we had the examples of uh, Christmas uh, night where they played soccer against each other. And, you know, I've actually walked some of the trenches uh, in Belgium. And there's some places, uh, and I walked some of the trenches where the Canadian troops were stationed, but also the British troops and stuff. In some places uh, of the trenches, interestingly enough, that line of division is not so clear at all. It's actually very unclear because you have the trenches coming within something like seven or eight feet from each other. And if one person puts their rifle and the other person, you know, they're, they're crossing their rifles. Uh, so, so that's how close they were for extended periods of time, mind you. That's like crazy close, right? So in that case, you need to develop certain kind of cohabitation and certain kind of, you know, relationship with the other side, if you will. So there are exceptions that, that don't deny the validity of, of, of what you just said. But let's zoom out perhaps a little bit more here and talk a little bit about sort of the motivation of your book. Why this book on ethics and technology and why now? So I think there's, there's various levels to that. The, the first reason why I started writing about ethics and I did it before the current political polarization nuttiness um, is because the instruments we're generating in science labs are so powerful. So the, the last book I wrote before this one um, was a book called Evolving Ourselves, which I wrote with Steve Gullins. And the notion in that book is, what would Darwin write if he was alive today? And and the reason why that's an interesting question is because for billions of years, what, what guided life forms, what shaped life forms into this or that and assured their survival or their extinction were two basic forces that Darwin and Wallace found. And, and those two basic forces are random, random mutation and natural selection. 
And so, you know, whether you're a bacteria or a mosquito or a mammal or a human, those were the two forces that shaped your existence. What's fascinating to me about what we've been doing as a species is we have flipped the logic of those two forces 180 degrees. So to make it more specific, when you talk about natural selection, usually it was nature doing the selecting. In the measure that it's not nature selecting, but it's human selecting. We're shifting nature, and, and let me unpack that. One of the least natural places on Earth is a cornfield or a wheat field or a soybean field. Because if you left that without human intervention, it certainly would not be a acres and acres and acres of corn. It would certainly not be amber waves of grain, right? And, and so what humans have done is they've said, I don't want any other plants. I do like dogs. I do like cats. I don't like snakes. I want this kind of flowering tree. I don't like this kind of poisonous tree. And so what we've done is we've taken half the surface of the earth and decided what lives and dies there. And if we left it fallow, a very different fauna would grow. So natural selection has become human selection. And that means that we are taking control over what lives and dies on this planet, at least on half the surface of the planet. The second portion of it is the random mutation part. You know, genes would kind of mix and match like dice. And you'd get blue and you'd get purple and you'd get bigger and you'd get smaller and you'd get this shape of beak and that shape of beak. But it all happened in a random way. And when humans begin to say, I want to shape this bacteria to create a vaccine, I want to shape this organism to make me yogurt. I want to change yeast to make this kind of bread. I want to change this to make this kind of yogurt. You don't randomly walk through a forest and find puddles of yogurt. Right? <laughs> That's something that humans have made for their own enjoyment. You don't randomly walk through a forest and find 50 varieties of cheese. Right? That's something that humans have been designing. But the, the difference, the qualitative difference that started in the 1970s is we started understanding how to do this in a very deliberate way. So when you start inserting genes, when you start doing biotechnology, as that accelerates, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to put this very specific instruction set into this organism to make this and have this outcome. And that is absolutely the opposite logic of random. That is the logic of intelligent design, to pick a random phrase. And when you're intelligently designing life, the overall consequence of that is you are directly and deliberately engineering the evolution of your species and other species. And that is an awesome responsibility. That is a godlike responsibility. And so we have to think about the ethics of that. Yeah, and that, of course, is the foundation of your other concept, uh, Homo evolutis, uh, which is an awful lot like transhumanism to me. Well, I think it's fascinating to me that people don't understand how many variants of humanoids there have been in history. And that, you know, we talk about diversity and we say we love diversity. No, we don't. We, we coexisted with at least four other species of proto-humans. We interbred with all of them. A lot of us have more or less Neanderthal inside us. Some of us have Heidelbergensis inside of us. We probably all have some erectus inside of us, but we eliminate all and reduce the diversity of humans. So that would be the equivalent of saying, there's only gonna be one species of bird in the world, regardless of whether you're in the Arctic or in the tropics. And that's what we've done. We've become a monoculture because there really is no racial difference between human beings. We, we are really new species. 
and we haven't had time to diverge and we haven't had niches to diverge into. But the normal and natural situation on the planet is to have variants of species. And as we engineer ourselves, if we're ever to get off this planet, we very much want some engineering because this body is not designed for Mars. This body is not designed for space travel. And there haven't been the evolutionary pressures to have the natural selection to be able to go somewhere else. So it's gonna to have to be a very deliberate engineering, but that's gonna bring up real questions because then you really are gonna get diversity in human beings. Um, and you can call that by many names, but I, I do think humans are going to start to diverge as we leave this planet. Speciation. Well, you know, the, the fascinating question, and, and words like speciation are so politically loaded, and you have to go back to what is a species. And that is a really hard thing to define. Just how much of a difference do you need to get a new species? And even the guy who wrote the origin of the species couldn't define species. And it drove him nuts. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm just trying to see what are the connection between your idea about evolution and homo evolutis and, and sort of the transhumanist community uh, is there any overlap, similarities, differences, uh, ideological or philosophical influences? So I think the transhumanist community, it's a little bit like that uh, joke of the blind blindfolded people trying to describe an elephant. <laughs> the four wise men and the, and the elephant or something. Yeah, Five depending ones. on whether you're touching the tail or you're touching the trunk or you're touching the foot. So, so there are so many different technologies that are coming online that can be used to do X, Y, and Z and modify first the body and over the next few decades, the mind. That depending on which camp you're in and how radical you want that change to be, you can be defined as a transhumanist by some, and is not a member of the transhumanist tribe by others. How do you uh, define yourself? I define myself as somebody who would like to see humans continue to evolve. I think, um, I think if you believe in human rights and humanity, and you look at what happens in the universe every day, there is an unimaginable amount of violence taking place in the universe every day. Those pretty pictures of nebulae are basically planets being, or suns being blown apart. Those pictures of black holes, those are things that are eating things. Last month we saw a picture of the spaghettification of a large sun. So you had the round orb of the sun and then you have this thing of light coming out of it almost like a tendril going into the black hole and, and it's a pretty picture but in essence it's the destruction of an entire solar system plus all of the planets around it because the black hole wants to have a snack when you see pulsars blow up when you see massive solar flares when you see huge bursts of radiation, but the universe is a really tough place. And what that means is there are millions of planets being destroyed and their suns in a common and natural process. All life on earth is concentrated in that wonderful Carl Sagan phrase of the pale blue dot. And the single most important picture ever taken by human beings is when they turned Voyager 1 around on Valentine's Day and took a picture from billions of miles away of this tiny, tiny pixel. And every life form that we know and every human that's ever lived 
lives on them. And we are vulnerable to something happening to that. So I am very much in favor of diversifying where we live, getting off this planet, not next week, not next month, not in the next decade, but sometime in the following centuries, because otherwise I don't think humanity survives in the long run. Very well. So I'm, I'm for that too myself. Hopefully without having to destroy our home. That uh, would be a good outcome. <laughs> it does. So in other words, I hope it's not like an abandoned ship kind of a situation, but it's more like, okay, let's build another ship and another ship and another ship. And we have all these ships at the same time now, rather than, oops, this ship is sinking. We got an abandoned ship. <laughs> no. so, yeah. So going back to your book, though, what's your kind of thesis? The, the thesis is right and wrong is 50 shades of gray. You can flip from one side to the other, often driven by technology. So as cost curves come down, you have alternatives that no generation had before. And you can easily see that with meat products. So the majority of people still eat meat. The majority of people still don't think that eating meat is, uh, you know, something unethical and horrible. But the first synthetic hamburger was made in 2013 and it cost, you know, 200 and some odd thousand dollars. By 2015, two years later, it cost $30. Last month at Whole Foods, it cost $9. And so you can easily see a system where synthetic meat is faster, better, cheaper than real meat. And you quit slaughtering 6 billion animals a year. And what I that think it's like more like 70 billion animals a year, over 70. Yeah. If you put all the chickens, not just mammals, but chickens, yep. like all, all the animals, and something like 1.2 trillion aquatic organisms or something like that. Yep. Yeah, Fish I mean, and, and no other, you know, aquatic. Incredible organisms. how much damage we do. Yeah. So, so as you're thinking about that, you could easily see a situation where you get a complete flip in the majority opinion. And people just cannot believe those pictures of you in the 4th of July barbecue burning meat on your grill, right? It, it, it'll, it'll just flip 180 degrees. How dare you have done this with living sentient beings? How dare you have treated them? But, but people will do that when they have an alternative to maintain their lifestyle, when it's faster, better, cheaper. And... That is a different system. Something very similar is going to happen with energy. So when you look at the cost curves for uh, alternative energies, the first solar panels were crazy expensive. And last week it was announced that the cheapest electricity on the planet came from these giant solar facilities in the desert. So what's happening is the unsubsidized cost of wind and solar is, has already crossed coal. So it makes much more sense just economically, not in terms of the environment and the planet and everything else, which is equally important or more important. But you're not going to get that shift in the majority's attitude and behavior until you can maintain your lifestyle and your heat and your air conditioning and your lights. But as soon as there's a faster, better, cheaper alternative, then you look back and you say, how dare those people have used coal? How dare those people have used oil? In the same way as we look back and say, why the hell did our ancestors kill all the whales to light their houses? And we're going to be judged really harshly for what we did. Um, it, it's, it's a true race and we better address this the for the first time i think in history at least human history 
the ice did not reform in the Arctic so far this year. You see the curves year by year and they're U-shaped. Now it comes down and it flattens and we flatten the wrong curve. And boy, if you live in a coastal city, you better think long and hard about what that means. Yeah, uh, and you say in the beginning of your book that we live in a in an age of exponential technology, and therefore, uh, at least in principle, we should also have exponential ethics. Uh, you also talk about humility and judging, and I just want to read here a quote. You say that in an era of extreme polarization and certainty, we need a touch more humility, less blame, and a certain knowledge that our descendants will consider us savages for some of the things that we do today. Judge yet today as thy wishes to be judged tomorrow. I like that a lot personally. Uh, but let me push a little bit here about uh, some of those examples that you gave. Uh, but first, let me ask you, so does that mean that you're vegan or, or vegetarian or whereabouts are you personally in that journey? Because you're talking, you brought the conversation about meat and stuff. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I'm becoming more and more of a vegetarian and being much more selective about how often I eat meat. Um, you know, again, coming back to Mexico, there is a very strong culture in Mexico that meat is something that is scarce and celebrated. Um, it, it was such a poor country for so long that all of the fiestas and a lot of the traditions are centered around extraordinary preparation, often of meats that wouldn't be considered the right meats in a richer society. So when you think of some of the great tacos of carnitas or buche, or when you think about goat um, as a core thing, or when you think about some of the parts of pork that are eaten, there's a celebration in the moles, there's a celebration in tacos, there's a celebration in all this stuff. I love that stuff. You know, I grew up with that stuff. Um, I'm eating a whole lot less meat. I'm trying to eat vegetarian most days. But I still enjoy an occasional great taco. Um, and I, it's a very guilty pleasure in the same way as sometimes I enjoy great sushi. Um, I'm Bulgarian originally, so I can sympathize with you, especially on the sort of a cultural pressure, uh, social pressure. So especially when I go visit my family in Bulgaria. Uh, however, I have been a, a vegan for the last five years now. So I'm just wondering, how do you square that personally? Like, everything that you told us about vegan meat before saying that you're kind of, you know, enjoying these guilty pleasures. Is, is that not like a, a little bit of a personal dichotomy or, you know, cognitive dissonance, if you will, to in some ways? Absolutely. Um, and it, it comes back to the... Uh the stuff that was drilled into me as a young Catholic boy, that we are all sinners. <laughs> we all sin. Um, we are flawed humans, and sometimes we have to ask for forgiveness. Um, I, I would be the last person to tell you that I am Mother Teresa and do absolutely everything right and follow everything to the letter of the law. I would tell you that if there was a faster, better, cheaper alternative, that would allow me to enjoy some of that in a cruelty-free way, there is no question I would do that. You know, this is the perfect opportunity where I got to push a little more on the ethics front here and stand up for ethics. And I want to do that in two ways. First of all, um, I want to say that, you know, that's kind of like one of my concerns because I've had these conversations in the transhumanist community for at least the last five years. And many people tell me kind of a derivative of what you're just saying. They're saying, oh, yeah, I'll be vegan. I'll be vegan when, you know, 
we can make you know a petri dish steaks and and burgers for 10 bucks and stuff cheaper than the steaks there now with equal or parallel you know taste texture looks smells etc identical basically that's when i'll be vegan and they're like yes i agree with you it's wrong to do it now 100 percent but i'm not gonna do it until it's cheap easy and convenient to me though as a philosopher someone who stands up for ethics and stands up for what is right or at least tries to and i'm not speaking about myself i'm speaking about my inspirations people like socrates you do ethics you do the right thing even when it doesn't pay for you even when it threatens your life like when socrates was sentenced to death in athens and he had the option of simply walking away because his students bribed the guards of his prison but he chose to instead of going exile and saving his life he chose to stay and you know fulfill the sentence of death that his favorite city put on him so he drank the hemlock and he died but in other words ethics is the right thing to do when it's the right thing to do even when it doesn't pay itself and that's about the same with being noble nobility is to me doing the right thing when it doesn't pay to do the right thing uh, same with generosity generosity is being generous when it's not it doesn't pay back to be generous so that's that's one sort of thing that i want to say and the other thing that i want to bring is a quote actually from a previous interview that i had on my uh show jenny kleeman who wrote a book on uh, sex robots and vegan meat and she was quoting a sociologist or, or a philosopher from england uh, and he said this and i think that's even more important and, and justifies even more why sometimes we have to go to the ethical pathway even when it doesn't pay and he said this his name is matthew cole by the way he's a vegan sociologist he says quote coming up with technical fixes rather than ethical reform revolution or rebellion every time the technology tries to stand in for ethics we do ourselves a disservice we deny ourselves the opportunity for growth so on the one hand i recognize the fact that you're saying that technology does influence ethics because as uh, martian McLuhan says first we build the tools then the tools build us there's no doubt about that on the other hand it goes the other way around and and maybe should go more the other way around in the sense that we need to not deny ourselves the opportunity to grow morally and the vegan meat example is a perfect example in, in my particular individual case that i thought okay i can wait the easy and the cheap way in the future when i'll be a vegan one day because i know it's the wrong thing to do but i know it's the wrong thing to do now so why don't i just do the right thing now instead of waiting for technology and science to provide me an easy and cheap solution and take this as an opportunity for personal growth so that's how i took it and that's the point that mark Cole, matthew Cole makes so well so what do you think of all these i think that makes a great deal of sense and i think you know you you pick your battles in this world and you pick some of the most important battles you can't fight every battle um, under the same logic it would probably make sense for none of us to use cars, to use air conditioning, to use electricity, to use computers, until they are powered by renewable resources. And that's a battle that some people are fighting. And under that thesis, it probably makes sense for people not to accumulate more than X dollars until everybody is fed and everybody has medicines and everybody has shelter because we have more than enough money. It's, it's no longer, economics is no longer a science of scarcity because we have enough. It's an issue of distribution. So I completely see that viewpoint i think you're right i think in retrospect on this topic you will be judged far more kindly than i will be 
I think one fights to make this world a better world and one is not a saint and one is not perfect. I agree, and I'm the least perfect of all, uh, even when, with my veganism, because for example, um, I started, you know, when I went vegan, there's this moment where you get pretty evangelical uh, in the beginning, especially. And I gave away my leather jacket, I gave away my leather boots, my leather belt and everything. And then I discovered that, you know, I had a leather belt that I had bought in Italy that I had for 10 years and it looked like brand new. And I changed three belts that were vegan and I threw them in the garbage and they don't dissolve because they're made of like oil uh, because many of the vegan letters are made of oil or some other material like that, by the way. Whereas if you have a letter good, it's going to degrade and biodegrade and become a humus eventually. Nur uh, nurture for the soil um, and and I bought three pairs of boots vegan boots for the Canadian winter here and they didn't last me a winter so then I had to go back uh, on some of those things so I bought like leather boots which are resolable because I had my previous bikers boots for 19 years and every time I wear the sole off I take them and they would put a new sole and my wife had her leather boots for 10 years in the Canadian winter. And then with the vegan ones, unfortunately, didn't make it that well. So now I, I had to make this tough choice and recognize the fact that I'm not a saint and buy leather boots for the winter, which are resolvable and which are going to last me at least five, maybe 10 years if you maintain them properly. And, and then when they are disposed, they would be biodegradable. So, you know, I wish I didn't do that. But in this case, in this particular situation, I kind of went back and then I dis discovered one of those cases that you talk about and that keyword humility. And I discovered how my evangelicalness in the beginning going vegan and, you know, I gave a perfectly good leather jacket that I've had for 10 years to a friend of mine. He's not wearing it because it's a little bit too big for him. Um, so it's not being used now. I had to change it with another two non-leather jackets in the meantime, which one of which is already in the garbage because it didn't last. And so I discovered humility in this particular context. Again, I discovered that my religiosity, vegan religiosity and zeal kind of didn't actually work out as I was hoping it was going to work out in the beginning. And that, you know, I kind of rushed of giving away and sort of seeing the light and all of those things, you know, and feeling righteous and, and pure and clean. You know, it feels very good, but actually it may not work out because then you discover, oh, the vegan leather is made of oil or other nasty stuff. Uh, so I think you know, I think that's a journey that a lot of us are on because we're, I, I think 96, 98, 99% of humans are decent human beings. They may have different opinions on different subjects from what you and I have, but you want to be able to have a conversation on most things and isolate the 1% of things that are non-negotiable. And, and there are things, you know, you go and you murder somebody, it's non-negotiable. You go and you take somebody's kids, that's non-negotiable. There, there are things which there is no middle ground and there's nothing to debate. But with greater or lesser shades of gray, you can adopt a series of positions. And I think in terms of impact on the world, both on a transition to being less cruel to animals and a transition to bringing more of the majority along, you can ask people to do two things. You can get very extreme and say, either you're a vegan or you're a bad person. Or you can say, look, before you become a vegan, why don't you try eating vegetarian a couple times a week? And then maybe you do it three times a week, and then maybe you do it four times a week. And I think that is a more effective way of bringing a majority of people over than to tell them tomorrow, 
you are all going to be vegan or else. I think there's also, you know, a concept of people brought up in different ways with different cultures and you may fundamentally find what they are eating or their customs wrong. You don't change those customs by showing up and saying, I'm here from Mucky Muck University X. I am smarter than you are. I know you are wrong and stop it. Because you create no space for the other person to listen to you, to dialogue with you, to come out of their trench part way as opposed to whole hog. And, and that's where this, it, you know, you need righteous activists in society and God bless them because they often are a radar that give us a view of why things that we are doing are just so fundamentally wrong and they act in a more coherent way than almost all of us do at great pain. There were women who stood up for the vote and were beaten and went to jail a long time before the majority voted for women's voting and women's rights. There were a series of people who argued for a very different treatment of slaves or indentured servants or serfs. But the question isn't, in my mind, the interesting question is not just how are these people so brave and how did they choose to do this even if they were shot or killed or tortured? The, the question that I'm interested in, in addition to that question, is how in the world did the majority opinion shift? And why is the majority opinion shifting ever faster on topics which are pretty fundamental topics of right and wrong? And, and that's, you know, for thousands of years, we did things to other human beings that we look back on and kind of go, how in the hell was that permitted? And what's fascinating to me is how fast things are shifting today, how fast things that we thought were normal and natural suddenly are absolutely unacceptable. Um, and, you know, I find that uh, in my own personal journey to see that and to find humility, uh, what helps a lot is to find role models. So uh, for me to dial down a little bit the, 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 the religious fervor of veganism uh, was my interview uh, in conversation with a philosopher, Peter Singer, uh, who basically, you know, started the philosophical foundation of the animal rights movement in a way. And yet he's very non uh, sort of uh, proselytizing. He comes across very humble. Uh, and, and, and I asked him, how do you do that? And he said, well, being in people's faces doesn't change their mind usually. Uh, you know, they even re retrench even more and become more defensive. Uh, so, so that's one thing I learned from him. And another thing is that the realization uh, struck me one day that I have become my wife's aunt in some ways. Uh, because, you know, many years ago, maybe 17 years ago, I remember the first time we were dating with my wife and I got invited over for Christmas to their house, to her mom's house at the time. And they put me right next to her aunt from Ohio. And uh, the first question that her aunt asked me was, are you a Roman Catholic? And, you know, for, the, for once in my life, I decided to be diplomatic and not, you know, wave my atheism, but say something like, well, you know, I consider myself to be more of an agnostic. To which she immediately responded, you burn in hell. <laughs> and, you know, I realized that in some ways, when I became like up in your face, vegan kind of, and hopefully for me, that was a very brief period, maybe a couple of months, maybe three or four months. Um, I was like that. 
And when I realized that, I was like shocked, but it helped me kind of modulate and dial it back and, and saying, wait a minute here, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> you burn in hell, right? Because then you get the opposite effect again that Peter Singer is talking about where people become defensive and then they push back, right? And and I've seen positive uh, examples of that. When we went vegan with my wife, uh, we were very evangelical and we got lots of pushback. Then we stopped being evangelical and five, six years later, my wife's parents, who are Roman Catholic, Italian, of Italian origin and very heavy meat eaters, now are talking about eating as little meat as possible, simply because they're watching us, they're watching how healthy we've been, how good we look, uh, how vital we are, how we're full of energy and all that stuff. And they're getting to a point of their life where at a certain age you, you start having certain health issues and then they're eating less and less meat. Not because we were trying to tell them to do it, but because we're leaving our message and they can see that without any pressure from us. And I was shocked when I realized that actually works so well. Yeah, and I think most people will meet you in the middle, right? I mean, it, while you're on the subject of religion, it's fascinating to me that people don't understand that almost every religion has gone extinct. So when you go and you visit your favorite art museum or your favorite history museum or your favorite archeological museum, almost every exhibit has to do with dead gods because you <laughs> used to worship Quetzalcoatl, you used to worship you know, the God of rain, the God of Zeus. The sea and Zeus and Ram and this, that, and the other. But, but almost everything in those museums is what was most important to that society at that time. And, you know, that was the God. And religions have to be to survive like a living organism. They have to adopt and adapt. And the religions that last over time are the ones that evolve. And when they become fundamentalist, when a religion says, it's my way or the highway, and all of you follow this, and there's an increasing gap between what they're preaching and what's happening, then they lose adherence and worshipers and end up being a niche religion that often becomes very violent because that's the way in which you keep your flock around you, your tribe around you. It's also fascinating to me that people don't understand how often religion is fundamentally shifted by technology or new discoveries. So the obvious example for, you know, Roman Catholics is Galileo, who was pardoned by the Vatican 300 years later. <laughs> um, but what, you, what you're watching in, in a really interesting way with evangelicals and Catholics and others is you're watching evolution in real time. And, and if, if you just take where a lot of Western religion comes from, it, it comes out of Abraham and the teachings of Abraham. And so that core trunk of Abrahamic tradition, you know, begets Judaism. And then Judaism begins to speciate into Orthodox and Reform and Ashkenazi and X and Y traditions. And then it also branches out Christianity. So you start with, you know, a Jewish Jesus and all of a sudden you get a huge trunk of Christianity that then begins to speciate into Dominicans and Franciscans and this, that, and the other. Orthodox, Catholics, you know, Baptists, Romans, Presbyterians, Adventists. And Russians, yeah, Orthodox, Greek, and everything Russian, else. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden you get Martin Luther and all that tradition. And you get this enormous tradition of Protestants. And then that begins to branch into all kinds of evangelicals and Baptists. And there are dozens and dozens of these folks. And by the way, you also get a branch that's called Islam that comes out of Abraham. So 
what you're watching in real time across thousands of years is the evolution of various niches and interpretations of Abraham. And the religions that don't do that, the religions that say, we are right, we will never learn, nothing will change us, no technology, no discovery will change us, are the religions that basically said, hey, if you don't sacrifice 20 virgins every day, the sun won't rise. Well, if the priest sleeps in one day and the sun rises, then people are going to begin to say, well, wait a second, why are we sacrificing all these virgins? Because there's a dissonance between the message and the result and the reality. And it's fascinating to me how religions can adopt a new technology and have an enormous impact. I'll give you an example of that. So one of the most interesting spread of a religion occurred over about 60 years, which was Islam. At the beginning of Islam, all of a sudden, you had this enormous spread. And a part of it was certainly due to the collapse of the Byzantine Empire. A part of it was certainly due to better generals and organization and new weaponry. But I think what people underestimate is the spread of Islam took place after the Justinian plague, which had killed an enormous percentage of people. And along comes this new religion, and what the worshipers of this god are saying is, please protect me from the plague. And let's just think of two different flocks. There's a traditional flock over here that basically says never get nude and bathe once a year. And there's a new religion over here that's saying you must pray five times a day and before you pray, you must wash your feet, you must wash your hands, you must wash your face. Well, during a time when you've got widespread plague that's killing big chunks of the population, guess what happens when this flock over here practices basic hygiene and this flock over here practices no hygiene. And guess on average who God is going to protect more. <laughs> and it's a similar thing with dietary traditions. So when you look at dietary traditions in the Middle East with Judaism and with Islam, you get similar prohibitions. So here is a group of people following one religious tradition that eats pork that live side by side with pork, often in the same house. And here's a couple of religious traditions, Judaism and Islam, that think pork is unclean, that think pork is dirty, and that you don't go near pigs. And during a time when the swine flu was widespread and killing a lot of people, during a time where trichinosis and basic refrigeration didn't exist, again, on average, guess which followers are more protected by their God. And, and that's the part that we just don't get and, and playing that forward, right? This seems like a tale of the past, but we're going to live this in, uh, I don't know if we're going to live it, but certainly our grandkids and great grandkids are going to live this. Those are all fascinating examples, Juan, but time is advancing here and I know it, your time is very valuable. So uh, let me try and bring in one technology that we haven't talked about yet here. And, you know, the name of my podcast is Singularity FM, so I cannot not bring that technology. So let's see how within, let's say, four or five minutes, we can bring in artificial intelligence and see what it could potentially tell us about ethics, about where we are, about where we're going from, how does it change things and so on. So artificial intelligence depends entirely on how you design it and what the parameters going in are, and then if there's autonomy, how it evolves. And so there's a completely different potential outcome to instruments that you are using that you understand what they're doing and can guide and instruments that begin to evolve 
autonomously. As you're thinking about letting loose something like that on the world, it boy, does it pay to go back and revisit all those evil genie jokes, <laughs> right? Of I want to be taller than everybody else and the genie cuts off everybody else's legs, right? There, there are true unintended consequences to programming something. And, and you can start with the best of intentions and say, I want everybody in the world to be equal. And boy, under that parameter, you could see some really horrible outcomes um, in, in every, you know, physical, mental, wealth, health, because that's not the right program for Africa. So I think one of the greatest challenges for human beings, which we're already facing, is first, the parameters you're putting in, and then second, the ability to guide the evolution of what you've let loose. And one of the prime examples of that is stock market trading. So there was a brilliant book written decades ago called A Demon of Our Own Design that talked about what would happen in the stock market if there was no human intervention and no logic behind the allegor algorithm of trading. And, and this is something that we should think about in real terms fast because that is a form of reactive AI where this program is reacting against that program at speeds that humans can't comprehend and many don't understand what's in there. And that's why you're seeing all these flash crashes. And when you put most of the markets into ETFs that are automatic trading facilities, trading against each other, you're just setting yourself up to live with the consequences of an AI you don't understand. Well, that's one example of AI that's certainly impactful, but we have other types of AI that people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and even the late Dr. Stephen Hawking has raised concerns about, even others like Bill Gates, uh, Steve Wozniak even, uh, and of course Stephen Hawking said that uh, AI may be the last, uh, maybe the end of the humankind. Then we have of course Ray Kurzweil with his concept of the technological singularity where he's gone on the record to give a very specific timeline to it. Uh, predicting it uh, for decades and decades ahead of time. Whereabouts do you see AI in terms of a general existential threat towards humanity? One and two, how or whereabout are you uh, along Ray's, Ray Kurzweil's idea of the technological singularity in its timeline? I don't think that I'm going to see the singularity. I don't believe in a single singularity. Um, I think that, you know, we will see many, many different points um, that don't necessarily converge on a single species of intelligence. I think we have to think carefully about word choice because I think so many people see artificial intelligence as this or that or that. And in a sense, what we're developing is the ability to process massive amounts of information and execute decisions under an enormous set of parameters. And just as the folks native to the Arctic have 50 or 100 words for snow, and we have one, um, I think it would be very important for us to develop 50 or 100 different words to parse singularity, artificial intelligence, all of these concepts, and, and think through very carefully, not a trench of I'm for artificial intelligence or I'm against, but where does this work? Why do we want it? How do we control it? Juan Enriquez, most recently the author of a book, very interesting book that I recommend called Right, Wrong, How Technology Transforms Our Ethics. 
Juan, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Other than your amazing TED Talks that you have so many of. You know, it takes me about six years to write a book. Um, I write a couple thousand pages or 3,000 pages, and then it comes down to about 200 pages. And I think what I'm trying to do with these books is to put something in place that may not break through the current political drama, but that will be important and relevant in 50 years or 100 years. So I, I spend a lot of time on those books, and I'd love people to go back and look at books that were written a while ago and laugh at the mistakes I made and also say, huh, maybe he wasn't completely wrong on this. Yeah, the 2005 book where you talked about the credit issues, the real estate market balloon and all that stuff is a good example, I think. Uh, so Juan, we've been talking today about actually more than 90 minutes now. What do you think is the best way to send away our viewers and listeners today? What's your final message or the one key takeaway that you want to send us all away with? Those of us who have enough food, shelter, and health are the luckiest generation that has lived on this earth. And on the one hand, we have a greater responsibility than any previous generation to make it better and to take care of it. And on the other hand, we have an opportunity to be curious, to learn, to grow, to be excited, to have fun. Because nobody else has ever had access to the information that we've had. But if you've got you know, a cell phone in your hand, you have access to information and worlds that nobody else in history has had access to. And this stuff was not around when I was born. You know, as people like to tell their kids, I was born before Google. <laughs> I was born before Facebook and Instagram, and they, they can't believe I was born before the internet. Oh my God, what are you talking about? You were in the dark ages. And, and these are instruments that shouldn't just bring you angst. They should bring you joy. They should bring you discovery. They, they allow each of us to learn and discover in ways that no previous generation's ever been able to do. So... I guess my two parting words would be only two things matter, Nike and Nissan. So just do it and enjoy the ride. <laughs> love it. Just do it and enjoy the ride. Totally love it. Okay. Fantastic. Juan Enriquez, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you so much. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 